my dear Jeff, I can't say enough how much I admire the way you have conducted your entire life and the way you have used your marvelous muse and how right she was to choose you because she's a rare bird who would have retired or died if you hadn't known how to amuse her and her you. That's one non-bogus marriage made on Parnassus and true. She knew exactly what and who she was letting herself in for, the real you. Drink, betting shops, and pubs are the sort of thing that rubs her up the right way. <laughs> She'll always stay and make you more beautiful and witty every day. This is a loose love ode owed to one of my friends, who is in my special collection of people who make amends for endless, excruciating, boring hours so often lived when foolishly pursuing stimulation. And none occurs. Stern, Benchley, Laycock, Carol, and Nash, and Lear are not more dear to me than bad rock Bernard. Shit. Uh. Fuck. Five in the morning. Time. It's only ten two, really.
I can I none, as they say in the saloon bar, so no one can say I didn't try to get out. <laughs> Still the worst places to find yourself locked in for the night than a pub, I suppose. I know a bloke who woke up at dawn in the back stalls of a cinema in Dover. All he could remember was a poster for high noon in the foyer and the fact that he'd got married at 12 o'clock the previous day in the Madeleine Road registry office. <laughs> He's divorced now, he can't even bring his ex-wife's name to mind, but he does remain a very great fan of Gary Cooper. <laughs> at least the coach and horses has a roof. One night when I was working on the sporting life, I woke up in a field outside Pontefract, and I still have no idea how I got there. Come to that, I have no idea how I got here. <laughs> that was a cut before the one, and I suppose I went down to the bog and crashed down to well past closing time, and I suppose I came back up here for the other one and quietly dozed off. It does happen. <laughs> Another time when I was in the sporting life, I remember opening my eyes to find myself in bed with Barry Brogan. Great jockey. <laughs> but not my idea of a desirable bed companion, then on yet another occasion, and I wasn't on the sporting life any longer. Dear Mr. Bernard, it will come as no surprise to you that following your unpardonable exhibition at the Point to Point dinner, which you attended as a representative of the sporting life on Friday evening, it is no longer possible for you to continue in our employ. Oh, God, I was supposed to be making a speech, something I'd never done before. I was so nervous, I went down to the Sporting Life office at crack of dawn to work on it. Smithfield Market was open, and I thought if I had a couple of drinks to get me going, I'd probably write rather a good one. This is not, you will agree, the first time your behaviour has compromised us. And to protect myself and all connected with the Sporting Life from further embarrassment... I have no alternative but to terminate your engagement forthwith. I drank steadily from six in the morning to seven in the evening, at which time I arrived at the hotel while I was proposing to speak and immediately passed out. <laughs> Two waiters had to carry me upstairs and put me to I bed. I am sorry this has become necessary, but you will agree. You were given every chance. I would be obliged if you would return to me your metal press badge at your earliest convenience. Yours faithfully, Editor, Sporting Life. From the Jeffrey Bernard collection of letters from the editor. Some people are in the habit of writing angry letters to the press. I get it the other way round. The, <laughs> the press is in the habit of writing angry letters to me. Dear Jeffrey, are you going to do the fucking article or aren't you? Yours, Miles Kington, literary editor, Punch. One day I was asked to write my autobiography and I put a letter in the spectator asking if anyone could tell me what I was doing between 1960 and 1974. <laughs> Dear Mr. Bernard, I read with interest your letter asking for information as to your behaviour and whereabouts between the years 1960 to 1974. On a certain evening in September 1969, you rang my mother to inform her that you were going to murder her only son. <laughs> if you would like further information, I can put you in touch with many people who have enjoyed similar bizarre experiences in your company. Yours sincerely, Michael J. Malloy, Editor Daily Mirror. I could die here. <laughs> it's a good thing I can hold this stuff tolerably well. I mean, if I were a Yob or a Hooray Henry, by the time the pub opens again, I could be one of those cases found by the coroner to have choked on their own vomit. Disgusting <laughs> phrase! When did you hear of anyone choking on someone else's vomit? <laughs> I'm putting these on the slate, by the way. I don't approve of freeloading. Dear Sir, may I add a few words to your excellent obituary of Geoffrey Bernard, who has regrettably died from choking. I knew him intimately for over 50 years and feel that many of his more remarkable qualities were left unsung in our otherwise comprehensive review of his messy life. He was born in 1932, probably by mistake, covered from head to foot in eczema. One of the first things he did was to wet the bed, and he continued to do so until he was 15. A week 
Thin-skinned and over-sensitive boy, he had few friends at school. He usually chose to sit at the very back of the classroom so that he could play with himself unobserved. <laughs> His early obsession with sex prevented him from attaining any worthwhile academic honours. By the time he left school, he had become a chain smoker and compulsive writer of fan letters to Veronica Lake. In 1946, he paid his first visit to Soho, and from that point, he was never to look forward. It was here, in the pubs and cafes of Dean Street and Oak Compton Street, that he was to develop his remarkable sloth, envy, and self-pity. At about this time, he began to realise that Geoffrey was not cut out for a career as a naval officer, as his mother had hoped. <laughs> He drifted from job to job, and between jobs he spent months at a time accepting small sums of money from homosexuals and friends. He began to develop a greed for unearned money and the growing conviction that he was cut out for better things. After a short, undistinguished spell in the army from which he was given a medical discharge with his paybook marked mental stability nil, he returned to Soho, got married for the first time out of four, and split up with his wife a few weeks later. It was during this period he first became involved with horse racing and gambling, and the feelings of infantile omnipotence that this activity prompted were to last him for the rest of his life. These feelings were particularly noticeable in his dealings with women, and some even said his life was a never-ending cliché of a search for his mother. His drinking began to escalate to such an extent that he was unable to hold down the most ordinary of jobs and he was consequently advised to take up journalism. <laughs> Even in this field, he was never offered a staff appointment and he gradually drifted into writing a series of personal and at times embarrassing columns about his own wretched experiences. After a spell in the alcohol and drug addiction unit at St. Bernard's Hospital, no relation, Hanwell, <laughs> he developed the fantasy that starting tomorrow it would all be different. <laughs> My last memory of Bernard is of seeing him staring at his typewriter and fighting yet another battle against his chronic amnesia. He leaves two unwritten books and a circle of detached acquaintances. <laughs> Did you know, by the way, there's a bloke in America who sells talking tombstones? <laughs> Before someone pegs out, as it might be a wife, they record a message on tape. Then when the husband turns up to put a jar of dandelions on her grave on Sunday, he presses a button and, lo, it's the same old story all over again. So there you are. <laughs> I'm amazed you managed to tear yourself away from the pub. Your dinner's in the oven. You're drunk again, aren't you? You make me sick. Honestly, I thought you'd change and settle down. Don't you ever think of the future? Christ, this headache's killing me. And stop staring at that woman in the next grave. <laughs> you needn't bother to come next Sunday. I'll be all right. Don't worry about me. You never did before, so why start now? Always thinking of yourself. Me, me, me. Good bloody bye. And where do you think you're taking those flowers? You make me sick. I'll try to give old Norman a bell, the landlord. Maybe he'll come and bail me out. Old Norman. He likes being called old Norman, that's why I do it. Sycophant that I am, he slings down the vodka snarls. There you are, get your own fucking eyes. I haven't got anything smaller. And we all say, good old Norman. <laughs> Fancy himself as a bit of a character. Most landlords do, have you noticed? And if they're not bits of characters themselves, then there are plenty of people who are. One time, when I was working as a barman, the publican was one of those dreadful people who call you squire and think of themselves as your genial host. On my first day, he came up to me when I was polishing the Smirnoff bottle and said, Sit up like Dinah. Now he's a bit of a character. Oh, yes, Governor. Well, you mustn't keep me from my work. Yes. Would you believe that man must lose at least six umbrellas a year? <laughs> Ha, ha, ha.
I know the shortage of eccentrics is acute these days, but <laughs> you'd think that a pub landlord of all people could come up with someone slightly more interesting than an umbrella loser. <laughs> Even I can do better than that. An antique dealer I know who was once voted Rat of the Week by the old Sunday pictorial. A doctor who's had a cold for five years and an ex-embassy press attaché who now writes the flagellation column for a sleazy magazine, and that's it on the top of my head. <laughs> Dennis Shaw. Does that name mean anything? <laughs> now, there was a character. The face that closed a thousand cinemas. <laughs> he used to play villains and Gestapo men in those wonderfully awful British B pictures. Twenty stone and encrusted in warts. Imagine a toad wearing a dinner jacket and that was <laughs> Dennis Shaw. Or Den Den, as he called himself. Den Den. One night, that dear sweet man, John Le Measure. Now, there was another character. One night, John Lemaire was walking along Piccadilly when he saw Dennis Shaw being bundled into a black Mariah for drunk and disorderly. John Lemaire gave Den Den one of his affable smiles and said, Hello, Dennis. Working? <laughs> <laughs> he must have been drunker and even more disorderly than usual because the police didn't like taking him in very much. But I found once when I tried to get him arrested for being boring. He gate crashed my table at a restaurant and thoroughly spoiled my dinner by just sitting there being Dennis Shaw. <laughs> then he got into my taxi and wouldn't get out. So I made the driver take us to Tottenham Court Road Police Station. Whereupon Den Den bounded into the nick, reappearing a few moments later with four policemen and booming. Gentlemen, I want you to meet Geoffrey Bernard, the biggest idiot in Soho. I <laughs> he then flopped down on the pavement and refused to bounce. But all the desk sergeant said was... Oh, we'd rather not rest, Mr. Johnson, if you don't mind. He's a bit difficult in the cells, is he? <laughs> <laughs> One night, I was out on the piss with Den Den, a rather difficult enterprise, considering he was barred from every pub within a six-mile <laughs> radius of Charing Cross, and we finished up in the Stork Club, and we went through the car, dinner, the full works, a bottle of champagne for me and a bottle of Gordon's gin for Den Den. <laughs> now, I've been paying all evening, in any case, a bugger owed me for enough dinners to feed the 5,000, so when the bill came, I refrained from picking it up. So did Den Den. <laughs> after a while, the waiters started stacking chairs on the tables, and after another while, the cleaners arrived and began vacuuming the floors. But still, we sat there finishing Den Den's gin with the bill untouched and unread on the table before us. Finally, the head waiter came over, and even in the cold grey light of dawn, you could see his face turn white as he saw who it was. Good morning, Mr. Shaw. So. You remember me? I do indeed, Mr. Shaw. Tell this gentleman where we last met. At the big eye, Mr. Shaw, when I was head waiter there. Under what circumstances did we first become acquainted? You refused to pay your bill, Mr. Shaw. <laughs> Tell this gentleman what your response was to that. I called the police, Mr. Call Shaw. Call the bastards again! <laughs> He was a collector's item, was Den Den. <laughs> and never lost an umbrella in his life. <laughs> he found quite a few, though. <laughs> Norman's got to be home, so I must be out for the count. I wonder if I put a call through to the engineers, they could somehow make it ring louder. I think it's left here for my benefit. One of those crappy features on the subject of alcoholism. Whatever the opposite of insomnia is, Norman has got it. An enviable talent, the only time I get a good sleep, is face down in the blueberry pie over lunch in the Groucho Club. Do you have a drinking problem? 
He gives you a list of odd questions, and if you answer yes, it shows there is serious cause for alarm. <laughs> Trouble is, the more I read these questions, the less alarmed I feel. <laughs> In fact, I've just this minute come to the conclusion I don't drink enough. I wish someone would pay me to write a quiz on boozing. I'll be laughing all the way to the grout show. I wonder if they'd pay me to supply the answers. Do you have time off from work because of drinking? Or has your work performance suffered because of alcohol? The situation is very much the reverse. Work frequently interferes with my drinking. In fact, <laughs> drinking is my work. I was once offered 500 quid for an article on this very subject. Do your Just a minute, I haven't finished. I'll have you know, I was fired by agent for being pissed all the time. I said to her, one of us has got to be sober and it isn't going to be me. <laughs> have there been family quarrels because of your drinking? I believe there was a tremendous row in 1934 over whether I should be fed Nestles or Cow and Gate. <laughs> and are you becoming difficult, irritable and testy after drinking? You must be joking, I'm impossible. After closing time last Tuesday, I hit a Greek greengrocer in Good Street who asked me not to feel his cucumbers. Do you find that your memory is getting worse? Could you repeat the question? Have you ever had loss of memory following a heavy drinking session? I honestly can't remember ever having had a heavy drinking session. <laughs> Do you order yourself a double when the rest of your party are drinking singles? Or do you order yourself a quick extra drink while collecting an order from the bar? None of my party drinks singles. They do have some style, you know. As for ordering a quick drink, I can assure you there's no such thing in this fucking place. It takes longer to get a drink in here than it does to get a refund out of the inland revenue. <laughs> Has your sexual drive and ability suffered because of your drinking? Mind your own fucking business. <laughs> Finally, do you ever experience... No more questions! Difference? It will soon be opening time in Billingsgate. You make me sick. In fact, I didn't want to say this in front of the Times, but owing to some tablets I've been taking in conjunction with a small port to which I'm not accustomed, that's what drunk chartered accountants always claim when hauled up at Bow Street. I find myself on the verge of suffering from impotence. Or incompetence, as some women call it. Though suffering is not the right word. Impotence has its drawbacks. Like we stand no chance of being held down and raped by three nubile girls, which is what once happened to a bloke on Malibu Beach, and the next day you couldn't see the sea for the entire male population of Southern California. <laughs> it's the least uncommon, you know. There are 55,000 impotent males in the Avon and Somerset area alone. That's what I read in the Daily Telegraph. I wonder how they know. <laughs> Were they shocked to the medical authorities by 55,000 disgruntled women? And why is the West Country so heavily afflicted? Could it be the cider? No. The causes of impotence are giving a stemming from diabetes, alcohol, pelvic injuries, drugs and psychological problems. If smoking 60 of these things a day counts as a drug, then I'm holding a full house for the first time since I played poker in the army. But I personally welcome impotence and wish it would hurry up and come, so to speak. I raise my glass to it, though not much else. What a release. <laughs> for the first time since the age of 15, when I formed an ambition to be a sex object instead of a good seam bow, though I will no longer be led about by my prick. Well, I ponder the fact that my life lies in ruins solely because I have always followed the direction in which my various erections were pointing. I wish to God I'd been born a girl, which reminds me. One day in the steam bath, I found Solly, a 75-year-old taxi driver, staring at his private member and moaning. We were born together. We grew up together. We went courting together. We got married together. We had children together. Why? Oh, why, oh, why did you have to die before me? <laughs> Another of the delights of impotence is that I should set fire to the bed a bit less often. You see, I'm somewhat in the habit of being asked for cigarettes by ladies while lying on my bed. Not after the event, but before. 
You see, what's happened is I've jumped the gun by getting into bed in the belief that I was being followed. But what these ladies do is light up a cigarette and give you a hundred specious reasons for having to go home. My husband may be phoning from Paris. My cat can't bear to be left alone. But we've only known each other for a day. Half a day. Half an hour. The babysitter will go mad if I'm late. People simply don't do it in broad daylight, do they? One more advantage, by the way, not having to wrestle with one-liners like those anymore means not having to put up with one-liners like these anymore after they've moved in. And where do you think you're going? You've been drinking. Can we go home now, please? Your dinner's in the oven. You make me sick. <laughs> but to get back to the bedside manner. I like you, Jess. I like you a lot, but not in that way. So, I resign myself to the situation take a Valium, fall asleep with the last fag in my mouth and wake up to find the bed in flames. <laughs> I started keeping a fire extinguisher by my bed, but I never knew whether to aim it at the mattress, the lady if she was still there, or my private parts. <laughs> Perhaps Norman's taken a Valium too. Maybe I should telephone the fire brigade. <laughs> Come on, Norman! Some of us have got homes to go to, as you landlords so often remind us. Well, now that I come to think about it, some of us haven't. Well, haven't they got labels on their head saying danger, government, health warning, women can seriously damage your brains, genitals, current account, confidence, razor blades, and good standing among your friends. Sometimes they walk out on you, other times they throw you out, all depending on whose bed you were in when you set it on fire. This was a throwing out job. At least I was allowed access to my worldly goods. Love locked out is one thing, but when it's love plus your books and Mozart tapes, all your spare clothes and shoes, plus your framed photograph of yourself with Lester Piggott, it can be well nigh unbearable while it lasts. <laughs> no one will call Lester a laugh a minute, but don't let anyone tell you he's no sense of humour. He even sent up his own legendary meanness. There's a story about the time, years and years ago, <laughs> when he'd ridden yet another winner and the stable lad was kept waiting for the customary tip. Uh, excuse me, Lester, do you think you could drop me a pound for the winner I did you? What? Uh, the winner I did you, you're going to drop me a pound? Who oh, hear you? That's my bad ear. How about a couple of quid for the winner? I did for you. Still go here. Try the one pound here again. <laughs> Some letters tied with barbed wire. I don't know why I bother keeping them or why they bother writing them. They're all identical. Dear Geoffrey, it was madness from the start. You must have known as well as I that it would never work. Why on earth did we ever start it? Your moods crushed me. I put out a hand, but you never took it. Well, you did take. My God, that's all you ever did. Take, take, take. You say you like women, but I really think you hate them. Not once did you ever listen to me when I wanted to talk about me. You were just waiting for me to stop talking and get my clothes off. Then, in that Chinese restaurant in Gerard Street, you finally did it. You insulted everything I hold sacred. The family unit, Carl Charlton Beaches, <laughs> Cosmopolitan, and money. No, I'm sorry, it's all over. 
I hope you find true happiness, as I have. Now, down to the filmmaker, aged about 30, who drives a Ferrari coupe with one bronzed arm leaning nonchalantly over the offside door. And who lives in a riverside penthouse with a Burmese cat, several gold medallions, a bottle of aftershave, an extremely expensive hi-fi set, and no self-doubt whatsoever. P.S. You make me sick. <laughs> she could have been the fifth Mrs. Bernard if I'd played my cards wrong. Trouble was, she had the most <laughs> extraordinary ideas about what's called... Settling down, this is a very curious phrase used only by women. <laughs> I've seen dust settling down, and I've seen feathered birds settling down, and I've seen bookmakers settling up even, but <laughs> what do all these women mean by settling down? I suspect they mean that life is no laughing matter. You could have fooled me. Well, what puzzles me is what on earth did my four wives think they were getting when they married me? I mean, you can see a train when it's coming. <laughs> but they thought I'd change and settle down. As a matter of fact, I think I have settled down insofar as I'm pretty set in my ways. I've come to terms with the fact that my dinner is in the oven and always will be. <laughs> I've also learned to accept the fact that... You only get out of life what you put into it. The sagacious prick who gave me that piece of information would have had his teeth knocked out if I hadn't been in an alcoholic and diabetic coma at the time, but <laughs> he meant well. And bless my soul, don't the ladies mean well when they ask you to change and settle down? Never trust people who mean well. Hitler probably meant well, and <laughs> Cromwell certainly hoped we'd change and settle down. Anyway, I was amazingly flattered when this girl walked up to me and said... When I first saw you in the pub, I thought to myself, what's this handsome man doing surrounded by rogues? Apart from her suspect eyesight, she's answered her own question, if you see what I mean. <laughs> Surrounded by rogues. Say no more. But for her, I try to change and settle down. Darling, I've invited a few rogues to Sunday lunch. No knickers joy says he'll weed the border. Maltese lorry is going to mow the lawn and Norman says he'll carve the joint. We could play bridge in the evening and perhaps I might splash out on a bottle of sherry. Oh, Geoffrey, you're an absolute puppet. I'm so glad you've changed and settled down. You don't miss Soho and all those awful people, do you, darling? Of course not, my angel. Take your knickers off. Whoa. <laughs> Forgot we're married and settled down in Chislehurst. But if I never change, neither do they. When they leave you, for instance, I wonder who writes their scripts. It's over. You've snapped at me for the last time. As far as I'm concerned, anything there was is finished. I can't say I was surprised, but I still couldn't get onto her wavelength. You might know that strange thought process. It has nothing to do with arrogance or conceit, simply a dull amazement at the fact that someone can't see how truly wonderful you are. I mean, there you are standing <laughs> right in front of them, the never-to-be-repeated offer of a lifetime, in your prime and only a short climb away from your peak, and the fools can't see it. It never fails for a moment. I don't mind going to the cinema with you or going Dutch for a meal, but as far as anything else is concerned, it's over. She stood there waiting for me to say something. I was thinking of six different things at once. Aren't you going to say anything? I couldn't. I was miles away. That business about going Dutch has really got to me. I had <laughs> a vision of us drifting out of cinemas and restaurants and me, or worse still, her, always saying to the management... Do you mind if we have separate bills? You see, I don't sleep with them anymore. Also... I was thinking how very hard she was going to be to replace. She still stood staring at me, her brown eyes flecked with malice and realistic thinking. Well... I still couldn't think of anything to say, memorable enough to haunt her for the rest of her day, so I <laughs> put on my mask of tragedy and went through the motions of offering up the late, late 
crowd. It's the one all hopeless punters mutter in betting shops, and it goes... Please, God, let's start again. I know I've been a fool, but if this horse wins the last race, I promise I'll never have another bet again, ever. <laughs> it doesn't work with women. It doesn't work with horses, either. <laughs> Very well. Suddenly I saw that picture from my school days of Napoleon on the deck of the Bellerophon saying farewell to Europe. And it wasn't Napoleon, it was me. Actually more post Charing Cross than post Waterloo, so far as I was concerned. I was upset. Yes. No one likes their sweets taken away. I wasn't heartbroken. So it's goodbye then. And she shrugged her mouth and left. I found myself thinking, it's like they say it is in novels, women really do turn on their heels when they go. <laughs> I watched her down the stairs and heard the front door close and I heard her nasty, tinny little Renault starting up below. I waited <laughs> for her to crash the gears, but she didn't. It's bloody fantastic, I thought, while well, I made some tea. After a scene like that, she remained so icy cold that for once she doesn't make a mess of the gears. I mean, I asked. <laughs> But a man behave in such an utterly cool manner after closing a rhapsodical chapter in his life, not him. He drives straight into a wall, blinded by tears at a moderately safe 15 miles an hour. And she comes <laughs> running down the stairs and out into the street, deliciously blaming herself. That's better. <laughs> I took my tea into the sitting room and sat there wondering at my own coolness. I felt ashamed of not being more upset. So I put some Marler on to see if he could provoke the appropriate misery. <laughs> not a sausage. <laughs> In fact, I sat there listening to the syrup, feeling distinctly irritated. She'd be on the phone by now, I reckon, to an old reliable friend. God, how I hate these old, reliable, pipe-smoking friends who, of course, have never laid a finger on the lady in question. They lecture at some obscure university on Anglo-Saxon pottery, and you can't get more decent than that. The bugger's just been waiting for her affair to go on the rocks till then. He's been hanging around like a non-functioning lighthouse. Now he suddenly lights up. No, actually, I was very fond of him, Bob. They always have old, reliable names like Bob. It's just that he needs more love than I can possibly give him. I know, darling, I know. Says Bob, patting her hand at the same time catching the wine waiter's eye, filling his pipe with St. Bruno, grinding the pepper mill over Madame's artichoke, and scribbling a note about a new find of sixth century cocoa mugs near Winchester. I really was very attached to him. It's just that I couldn't take any more of his eternal snapping. I know, I know. But you must have known it couldn't last. I could tell he was troubled from the moment I set eyes on him. But of course, one doesn't like to pour cold water on love's young dream. How about throwing up on it, then? <laughs> and then after plying her with wine, he wastes a perfectly good dinner by pouring her into a taxi with the words... What you need, my dear, is a good night's sleep. Now just you try to forget all about him. Dear Bob, I don't know what I'd do without you. Well, that was a long time ago. I haven't seen her since. The Marla's well scratched by now, and I've licked my wounds clean. Then two weeks ago, she rang me up and asked me if I happened to know of a good plumber. <laughs> Some people have no sensitivity whatsoever. Tortoise shell hair brushes, how did I acquire these? I know. In settlement of a bad debt by a very severe case of alopecia. <laughs> I wonder what it's like to be a tortoise. <laughs> Not a barrel of laughs, I shouldn't imagine. <laughs> You can't be frivolous or facetious if you're a tortoise, can you? 
You're in danger of being turned into a pair of hairbrushes. <laughs> but you do have a fucking home to go to. <laughs> God, I hate flat hunting. I hate staying with other people while I'm looking for somewhere to live. No matter how kind and generous they are, you can see them looking at you all the time with their eyes pleading. Please, please, Jeff, don't get pissed and set the flat on fire. <laughs> <laughs> One thing I know, I'll never ever again live anywhere beyond staggering distance of the coach and horses. I pitched my tent in Soho at around 13, and it's been a downhill struggle ever since. And if anyone wonders how such a dump could possibly have gripped me and seduced me, then they didn't know Soho when you could end up drunk, penniless, and alone on less than a pound. <laughs> to step out of both the classroom and my mother's Dresden littered drawing room into this enchanted dung heap was like waking up in Disneyland, Treasure Island, Pleasure Island, you name it. And what an amazing mixture I've had the luck to stumble across, mostly in the gutter where you meet the best company. Poets, painters, prostitutes, bookies runners, bohemians, bums, philosophers, crooks, Cranks, Dylan Thomas, Francis Bacon, John Minton, Lucian Freud, Frank Norman, French Vera, No Knickers, Joyce, Sid the Swimmer, Ironfoot Jack, Nina Hamnet, Muriel Belcher. Muriel Belcher. <laughs> she ran the Colony Room Club, or Muriel's as it was always known. I can see her now, sitting on her stool at the end of the bar like a raven on its perch and chatting up the punters. Come on, cunty, spend up. You're not buying enough champagne. Are you a member, sir? Go on, then. Fuck off. Members only. <laughs> she did have her favourites, though. There was a charming old queen who worked in the city and drank scotch for England at Muriel's every evening. He was... More or less a club hostess, but it happened he'd won the Military Cross in 1916 when he was a captain in the Guards. And if anyone asked Muriel why she put up with him, she always said... She was a very brave little woman at the Somme. <laughs> What's this bearded bugger? Well known for his compulsive verbosity. One afternoon he walked to Muriel's and said... Muriel, I'm worried. I've got to go to a fancy dress party tonight and I can't think what to go as. Why don't you put talc on your chin and go as an armpit? too good to miss a moment of, so of course, working for a living was out of the question. I did the odd job obligatory in the life of a bum, navvying, dishwashing, acting, even a spell down a coal mine and then in a boxing booth in a fairground. But I was always drawn back to Soho, who was always there waiting for me with open arms and legs. Rosencavalier. Must be when I was working as a stagehand at Covent Garden. Did you know? I've seen shifters and fly men at the Royal Opera House how the most discriminating critics you could wish to meet. I trust their judgment rather than those long haired prats on Radio 3 any day. I don't care who she is. I'm shit better rose than Kevin is than this one.
And I realize it's highly likely that the two biggest of the many mistakes I've made in my life were to have moved from Soho to Suffolk in 1966 and from Soho to Berkshire in 1978. Both times with new wives in the pathetic belief that geographical change would solve all my problems. But any belief that living in the country is romantic is all romancing so far as I'm concerned. The idyll is utterly without stimulus and all those trees and all that grass <laughs> drain the spirit. <laughs> I once foolishly remarked to Francis Bacon how he could solve all his tax headaches by moving to Switzerland. Are you crazy? All those fucking views, they drive me mad. <laughs> and it's not only the views. It's the dreadful horse brassy pubs run by rude, jumped-up shopkeepers in blazers and cravats. <laughs> and it's the bloody regulars. <laughs> the backbone of England. And his lady wife, Mrs. Backbone. <laughs> of neck of the woods. They invariably make the same entrance wherever they go. I presume they're rehearsing it as children. Then Mr. Backbone says... Brrr. <laughs> and Mrs. Backbone says... <laughs> then Mr. Backbone says... What will you have, darling? And Mrs. Backbone says... Oh, yes, let's see. What shall I have? So Mr. Backbone says... Well, why don't you have a whiskey mat? And Mrs. Backbone says... Yes. Why don't I have a whiskey mac? Good idea. Good idea, darling. Yes, I'll have a whiskey mac. What are you going to have, darling? Asked Mrs. Backbone. I'm not sure, darling. I know. Says Mr. Backbone. I think I'll have a nice bottle of Guinness. There. Then when Mr. Backbone dips into his pocket for change, he drops a coin on the floor and quick as a flash, the barmaid Leave says... Leave it for the sweeper. Pause for laughter. <laughs> <laughs> then... When the drinks have been savoured by our resident Bisto kids, <laughs> the backbones of England smile knowingly at one another, and Mr. Backbone says to the barmaid, Busy at Christmas. And the barmaid says, Oh, terrible. Packed all the time we were. Well, says Mr. Backbone. That's over for another year anyway. And Mrs. Backbone, her nose dripping in unison with his, decides it's time for her to scintillate. Yes. <laughs> for another year. Yeah, well, you can say that again, darling. Says so Mr. Backbone nodding approvingly at a horse brass and does so. All over for another year. I know deep down they're going to continue to plunder the calendar and I should leave now, but I don't. I just wait for it as Mr. Backbone rubs his hands together and says to the still life with pineapple ice bucket. <laughs> How was New Year then? New Year! Walks the barmaid. Don't talk about but it. But Mr. Backbone does. Oh, like that, was it? And uh, Mrs. Backbone echoes. Like that, eh? Hey? To which she adds saucily to Mr. Backbone. Ah, oh, that's pretty hectic too, though, wasn't it, darling? You always use. Concurs Mr. Backbone. <laughs> Still, you expect it, don't you? Wouldn't be New Year if it wasn't, would it, darling? Says Mrs. Backbone, and I fuck off before they start on their forecast for Easter. <laughs> I do have one unfulfilled ambition as regards the country, though. <sniffs> I once remarked to Fred Winter on how healthy his horses looked. That's because... <laughs> they don't stay up all night playing cards and drinking vodka. And it occurred to me to wonder what would happen. <laughs> this is what would happen if you fed into the average farm animal what some of us consume in the course of a single day. 
I would very much like to wake up one morning with a cow of the Friesian variety and walk her down here to the coach and horses, stop me on the way to buy 20 players, <laughs> ply her with vodkas until closing time, whip her off to an Indian restaurant, <laughs> take her up to the colony room till 5.30, then on to the York Minster, Swiss Tavern and Three Greyhounds. Get beaten up by Chinese waiters at midnight, have a row with a taxi driver, set the bed on fire, put it out with tears and wake up on the floor. Could you then milk said cow? I doubt it. <laughs> Norman! Will you please answer the bloody phone? I'm locked in your pub and drinking all your vodka and another thing, there's no ice. Not that that would move him, the ungracious bugger. Yesterday I asked him for the menu and he threw it at me. When he brought my cottage pie, I thought he was going to throw that at me too. Instead, he said to the man sitting on that bar stool, Get off your arse and let Jeff sit down. He's fucking ill. <laughs> I am fucking ill too. As a spectator always puts it, when well, I'm too fucking ill to write my column. Geoffrey Bernard is unwell. I tell a lie. They don't invariably say that. They have been known to put it another way. Geoffrey Bernard's column does not appear this week, as it is remarkably similar to that which he wrote last week. <laughs> <laughs> Why do you drink so much, Mr Bernard? To stop myself from jogging. I'm about to do you a favour. I'm going to refrain from advising you what to back in the big race tomorrow. A tip is only an opinion, and I'll give you a tip. The nearer the horse's mouth it is, the more it's worth ignoring, and that goes each way. The trouble with betting is that if you lose, you lose. And if you win, you think about how much more you could have won if you double the stakes. It's pathetic, <laughs> really. I think a psychiatrist I know probably hit the nail on the head when he described punting as... Collecting injustices. This was when I was in a very curious establishment in Surrey, which was like a gambling research clinic. <laughs> On the third day of my confinement, the psychiatrist came along and sat at my bedside with a great wad of papers, an instrument for measuring blood pressure, a thermometer, and the sporting life. I thought he was going to delve into my childhood and establish whether I still felt guilt in introducing the sport of masturbation to my prep school. As a matter of fact, I felt like Marco Polo returning to Europe with a new invention of gunpowder, and soon the whole <laughs> school was rocked to its foundations, both metaphorically and physically, but not a bit of it. He went straight to the point. Do you think King's Ransom has a better chance than Baby Dumpling at York's this afternoon? <laughs> no. <laughs> Looking at the weights, I say the baby dumpling has a better chance than King's Ransom. You really are in a bad way, my friend. King's Ransom will piss it. <laughs> <laughs> he then went off to back King's Ransom and thus prove I was mad, but baby dumpling pissed it. <laughs> I should be careful, Mr. Bernard. We had a man in here who was such a good tipster, the psychiatrist kept him in for five months. <laughs> Promise? <laughs> Drink your bovril. Now, I became hooked on racing when I was about 16 and doing time at a disgusting naval college called Pangbourne. A boy called Vickers got 12 of the best, the maximum. For making a book, I was deeply impressed. They put gambling in the same wicked league as drinking and sex, and if it was as bad as that, I wanted some of it. It took 35 years for retribution to set in, not 12 of the best, but an appearance at Bow Street Magistrate's Court. After a long series of contributions to the Joe Coral Benevolent Fund, my luck changed, or so I believed at the time. I had a Yankee up and won over two grand. A big win for a small punter. It was the kind of win that compensates for all the losses. But then I began to reflect that since it had taken three and a half decades to arrive at this one big win, 
Punting was indeed a mugs game, after all. So I decided to open a book. Just among friends and acquaintances in a small, fun sort of way, but the law didn't see it quite like that, and my luck changed again. On 13th June, at approximately 1400 hours, I entered the Coach and Horses Public House, Greek Street, London W1, as an officer of Customs and Excise. A television set was switched on showing racing from Sandown and York. A man who I now know to be Geoffrey Bernard said... Does anybody want anything on this? Just as the three o'clock race from Sandown was starting, I asked a woman at the bar for the running number of a horse called Bonamy. She consulted her newspaper and replied. At this point, Mr Bernard said to me... Do you want a bet? I handed him two one-pound coins and asked for Bonamy. Two other customers handed Mr. Bernard coins and both asked for Bonamy. Mr. Bernard turned to a female companion and said, If Bonamy wins, I'm fucked. <laughs> Bonamy lost and I left the premises at approximately 15, 18 hours. Would you care to sit down, Mr. Bernard? Just a few questions. Now. Do you pay tax to the government on these bets you've been taking? How could I? I'm not a licensed bookmaker. <laughs> you think it's against the law not to pay tax? I do now. <laughs> Why do the regulars bet with you rather than go to the Mecca around the corner? They regard it as fun and are too lazy to desert their drinks and go to the betting shop. It is a joke between us. I think they are fools and they think I am one. We are taking the piss out of one another. Did they bet with you because you don't charge tax? No, it's a game! No one's that mean, at least my friends aren't. How well do you have to know someone before you take a bet off them? They have to be friends or acquaintances, not strangers. Most of them are good mates. Would you be surprised to know you've accepted bets from customs officers? Fuck. <laughs> it took nine policemen and three customs men in one wagon and one squad car to arrest me. <laughs> Little me. At how much public expense, I don't know, but they recovered the vital sum of £31, 12p in evaded betting tax. Anything known? Not a lot. I was once nicked for going over the top with a rubber plant in the Raj of India restaurant. <laughs> but I collected another bit of a criminal record for kicking someone's car parked annoyingly on the pavement. A CID man arrested me here in the coach and horses and took me to Vine Street to be fingerprinted and photographed. It's an extraordinary thing. As we were passing a certain pub on our way to the nick, the detective suddenly said, You screwed the landlord's daughter here in 1976, didn't you? I was amazed how anyone but me and the party of the second part could have knowledge of what went on that Christmas day on the saloon bar floor while the governor went upstairs for his after-lunch nap. I'll never know. <laughs> but I liked the magistrate. He looked up my previous form and said, Well, last time it was rubber plants, Mr. Bernard. Now it's cars. What next? Making a book without paying betting tax. That's what's next. Fine. Fine. Two hundred pounds and fifty pounds costs. Ah, well, a mere flea bite compared to what the sods did to Lester Piggott. <laughs> and as we all say around here, if you can't take a joke, you shouldn't have joined. Oh, dear. When Norman finally does surface, he's going to think I look more dishevelled even than after that night I spent in the ditch of the celebrated pond fence at Sandown. I don't know how I got there or who my companion was, but we got on famously. People are always surprised to learn that I'm a domestic animal.
Who the hell do they think washes my glass up every morning if there's no one else to do? I cook, I sow, I reap. <laughs> Slightly rhyming verses for Jeff Bernard's 50th birthday by Elizabeth Smart. Wild would have smiled and been beguiled and bright enough to know that you had a better muse in tow than he. Could he see the angelic emanations from gutters where we all fall while trying to pee and rise or try to rise unwisely in majesty? Your subject is not mean who's up, who's in, or jockeying for position. What a dreary sin. Funny but kind. Your subject is justly seen as the inexhaustible one of nude mankind. Yourself, in fact, drinking amidst the alien corn and explaining the amazing joke of being born. Explaining the amazing joke of being born. It's terrible to think that dear Elizabeth got me my first job in journalism. We got drunk together one lunchtime and she took me back to her office at Queen and said to the editor, give him a job. He did. So then I was a reasonably happy, sane stagehand. She's dead now, like too many of my friends. God forgive you and rest in peace, Elizabeth. And if anyone writes to tell me you only get out of life what you put into it, I might just kill them. <laughs> that was the most touching, but not the only poem I've had addressed to me. With the crown of thorns I wear, why do I need a prick like you? <laughs> If you choose to bugger off, it isn't going to spoil the view. I've been put down by the best and crucified by experts, dear. And I really do not need a friend like you to bend my ear. You claim that generosity is something that I lack. May I suggest you've had from me much more than you gave back? So don't think I'll mope and mourn because you tell me that we're through. With the crown of thorns I wear, I sure don't need a prick like you. <laughs> Geoffrey, I want to know who wrote that poem to you and why. <laughs> Jeff! Geoffrey! Oh, you make me sick! This is going to do my reputation no good so <laughs> How absurd! How ridiculously absurd! Which makes me a survivor, I suppose. <laughs> a good friend of mine, Eva Johansson, used to say, you can't get through life without a highly developed sense of the absurd. She could well have been here now to recognize the absurdity of my situation. But one night she went to bed drunk with a lit cigarette in her hand. And in her case, she was taken seriously. <laughs> How inconsiderate, Eva. Soon there will be no one left to drink with at all. The rows we used to have always in pubs, and if Norman or some other anxious landlord tried to intervene, she'd say with her winning smile. It's quite all right, this is a friend of mine. I'm just trying to explain to him what a stupid bastard he is. Well, our longest standing row went back to when I was living in the country, and I asked her what she'd like for breakfast. A slice of cold, rare roast beef and a glass of tea of pepe, preferably chilled. 
Why can't you have a fucking egg like anyone else, you <laughs> flat cow? Because I am not anyone else. <laughs> she wasn't. One of these people she used to call these people approached her here in the coach and horses with a view to picking her up. Good morning. Nice day. Your place or mine? <laughs> Exit frightened rabbit. Someone who did succeed in picking her up and became a good friend one day said to her for some reason... You know, Eva, if I hadn't met you, I think I'd have taken up keeping bees. <laughs> <laughs> he was ever often known as the beekeeper. And Eva said... The poor sod wanted to keep bees. And he ended up with a hornet's nest. <laughs> <laughs> a few months before she set herself on fire, she wrote to me and it was a case of like calling to like. So I have no flat, no job, no lover. No income, as far as I can see, no prospects. Even my cat has left me. <laughs> I keep sitting around expecting fear, and all I'm getting is exhilaration. Here I am exulting in the clean, dry air of absolute selfishness, secure in the knowledge there's nothing more they can do to me. If it weren't so totally out of keeping with everything I've been told, I'd say this could only be described as happiness. Wake up, Norman. <laughs> Engaged. <laughs> At least that means he's stirring. You won't begrudge me breakfast, will you, Norman? Now, shall it be tea and bickies? Tea and vinegar-flavoured crisps, tea and prawn crackers, tea and tortilla chips, tea and roasted peanuts, or tea and pork scratchings. And is it possible to boil an egg in an electric kettle? <laughs> tea and bickies, I think. Oh, fuck. What was that trick Keith Waterhouse used to do on the dance floor of the old establishment club with the biscuit tin lid and what else? A pint glass filled with water, a match box, his right shoe. <laughs> and a raw egg. <laughs> and what you do... You put the biscuit tin lid, lip side up, squarely over the pint glass. So. And then you make a funnel of the matchbox sleeve. And you place it on top of the biscuit tin lid. Bang in the centre. Then... You perch the raw egg on the funnel. And what you do then is you give the biscuit tin lid as an almighty thwack with the heel of your shoe. <laughs> that the lid flies off across the room and the egg plops into the glass. Or not, as the case may be. <laughs> I've never seen the trick done unsuccessfully, but Keith tells me that when it doesn't work, it's remarkable how great an area one little egg can splatter. <laughs> he was in a hotel once in Birmingham for some reason and doing the egg trick in the residence lounge for some reason. And there was his 18-year-old snooker champion at the bar, very high in the success he just had, so of course he wanted to do the egg trick and got Keith to show him how it was done. Then he did it himself, and the egg caused 3,000 quid's worth of damage to the decor. 
And just before he was thrown out, he asked Keith, where'd he gone wrong? And Keith said... <laughs> I forgot to add, you've got to be at least 50 years old and pissed out of your brain. <laughs> Well, I'm at least 50 years old. You need a good and steady hand, Keith said. <laughs> Here goes. One, two... I wish I hadn't done that. <laughs> I hate pub tricks. Next thing I'll be telling Irish jokes. <laughs> but if memory serves me right, which he doesn't very often, we were talking about racing. At times I think it would save a great deal of time and travelling expenses just to get up in the morning, shove 50 quid down the loo and pull the chain. A lot of times, I like to spin out the agony by going to the races. I once went to an evening meeting at Windsor, got an absolutely arsehole, lost every penny in my pocket and had no idea how to get back to London after the last race. I was practically the only person left on the racetrack. And as I stood desolately in the car park, I suddenly saw this beautiful white Rolls Royce heading for the gate. I stood in its path and signalled it to stop. The owner... Suave as any film star said. Yes, what can I do for you? I said. He said, I'm pissed and potless. Please take me to the Dorchester immediately and buy me a drink. <laughs> I'd never seen him before and I'd never seen him since, but he was <laughs> absolutely charming. He recognised someone who'd done their bollocks and was feeling thirsty. He drove me straight to the American bar at the Dorchester and stood me a huge one. We never introduced ourselves. He just filled me up and gave me my taxi fare back to Soho, and that's typical of what you find at the races. He wouldn't get it in a soccer stadium. <laughs> or at a cricket match. The racing world is stuffed with... Lunatics, criminals, idiots, charmers, bastards, and exceptionally nice people. <laughs> like, for example, Valentine Dial, the actor. Remember the man in black on the wireless? Who was involved in a classic exchange in the bankruptcy court. To what do you attribute your downfall, Mr. Dial? Two and a half mile handicap hurdles, sir. <laughs> I attribute my own downfall to my parentage. I was sired by a scenic designer who was himself by a theatrical impresario out of an actress. <laughs> my dam was an opera singer who was by an itinerant pork butcher out of a gypsy. <laughs> my father designed the lion's corner houses. Did you know that? And his son washed up in them. <laughs> he also designed the entrance of the Strand Palace Hotel, which is so brilliant it's now in the Victoria and Albert Museum. In any other country, it would still be outside the Strand Palace. <laughs> he was an architect. Well, he would be, wouldn't he? My mother was very beautiful and she had style. She was once in court for non-payment of a debt. She must have taken after one of her sons. When she got involved in a slanging match with one of the lawyers, the judge intervened. If you continue to speak in that vein, Mrs. Bernard, I shall have to commit you for contempt of court. Make that utter contempt. <laughs> She 
She wanted to turn me into an officer and a gentleman. But at the same time, she was throwing occasional cocktail parties for musicians, actors, actresses, and similar interesting riffraff. It didn't take me long to see they were all getting a little more fun out of life than the Latin master at my prep school or the local grocer in Holland Park. At Naval College, I fell naturally into the company of secret gold flake smokers and cherry brandy swiggers who got into trouble. And the officer and gentleman idea was knocked on the head by my being asked to leave. <laughs> the captain of the college paid me the greatest backhanded compliment I've ever received. Dear Mrs. Bernard, while I consider Geoffrey to be psychologically unsuitable for public school life, I believe he has a great future as a seam bearer. <laughs> and with that reference, I set forth on the great journey of life in search of yet more trouble. I didn't have to look any further than the races. All the lunatics I've known in racing, the looniest was a brilliant trainer whose wife had triplets, two boys and a girl. One night after the wife and kids had gone to bed, he was downstairs enjoying a gargle with a merry band of punting mad Irishmen when he had a brilliant idea. He crept up to the nursery, came down with the triplets in his arms and dumped them in a row on the sofa. All right, gentlemen, now we are going to play Find the Lady. Now, now, now. Now watch me, watch me, watch me shuffle the babies. <laughs> You see, there is no bamboozling or trick babies involved. It is the quickness of the hand which deceives the eye. Now, uh, Geoffrey, you look like a sportsman. Place your bet. <laughs> I'll take a fiver on... The middle one. Jeffrey bets that the lady is the middle one. Is he right or is he wrong? <laughs> oh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry, my friend, on this occasion you lose. But give the game another sporting try. Find the lady, now you see her, now you do not. I switch the babies and you place your bets. The quickness of the hand is in the eye. Would you people... put those triplets back where you found them, please? <laughs> The true gambler will, of course, bet on anything, and there's no cure. Sometimes, when there's nothing to bet on, I worry, quite seriously, about going mad. In fact, another winter could do it. The long-range weathermen say the athletes among us will be skating on the Thames come January, and you know what that means, don't you? No racing. <laughs> Not necessarily. dividing line people are so fond of referring to, the one between sanity and insanity, was breached by that bloke there. An equally mad bugger known as Tom the copywriter, plus my good self, the last time we had a surfeit of snow and ice. Casper, his name is. He works or used to work until he was fired for spending too much time in the betting shop in one of the foreign embassies. Not exactly a career diplomat, but what's a career when there's racing at Doncaster? <laughs> Casper's wife left him after he told her in a moment of intoxication and great frankness that in his considered opinion, when it came to who had the strongest hold on his affections, his wife or the great Italian racehorse Rebo, Rebo won by a furlong. So <laughs> there was Casper living all alone in this enormous flat opposite Battersea Park with his two cats, Keir Hardy and George Lansbury. So he was something of a socialist, was Casper. And when he began to piss down with snow. Disaster. All racing cancelled. Not necessarily. For three weeks, we fidgeted here in the pub, reliving the glories of our past wins and near misses, and I desperate for a horse to lose our money on. Then, 
On the 22nd day of the great cold spell, Caspar walked in and said... Who fancies coming or racing tonight? Where? Australia or California? Battersea. There's been no dog racing at Battersea for a month. Not dog racing, my friend. Cat racing. When I spoke earlier of going mad, I didn't necessarily mean that I would be the first in our little group to crack. <laughs> Cat racing. Round at my place. That would be a flat race, of course. <laughs> Normally, yes, but since we're in the middle of the national hunt season, I've had to build a hurdle course. Three jumps and it's a good 40 foot from the starting post here at the kitchen end of the passage to the front door so we get a run for our money. What are the odds? <laughs> Evens, Kia Hardy. Three to one the field. <laughs> Both under starter's orders, are they? Well, put it this way, Tom. I haven't fed these cats for two days. <laughs> now, I am going to place a saucer, saucer of tinned salmon here yeah. at the front door. Yeah. <laughs> Give them a good sniff of it. to the kitchen, and now they're off. But, uh, but they're not. Well, not yet, they're not. Hell, Kiahar, I mean, it's a 7.30 meeting, isn't it? <laughs> of course it is. It's only 7.29. You've got to do these things right. George Lansbury really looks a goer. <laughs> I have a pound to win. Same on this bugger. And let him go, Tom, and... They're off! Jump! Oh, you bastards, jump! You could have jump! 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 Kill Hardy by three lengths. Well, he and the runner-up devour their tin salmon. Tom, Casper and I retire to the sitting room, here and after referred to as the steward's room, <laughs> to discuss the next meeting. I've got a moggy I wouldn't mind entering, Casper. A little tabby. Called Samantha. Ah. A filly. Two-year-old. <laughs> Form. She's never been in a cat race before, but with the dog next door behind her, she's a goer. <laughs> she's entered. Samantha missed the first race, being delayed on the tube due to incident online at Earl's Court. Some poor frozen sod threw himself under the train in a last desperate effort to get warm, I shouldn't wonder. <laughs> Kia Hardy once again romped it, and once again I went down on George Lansbury, whose form I'd been led to believe had improved. I said to Casper, This is not going to be a bundle of laughs if the favourite is going to win every race. You're right. When Samantha turns up, we'll make it a handicap race. <laughs> How do you propose to do that? With the weights from the kitchen scale. <laughs>
Of course. <laughs> we agreed that if horses get three pounds for a length, then cats should get an ounce for a length. <laughs> Keir Hardy finished up carrying three ounces stuck to his back with sellotape. <laughs> And Tom turned up with Samantha, this evil-looking tabby outsider. Samantha was very much on edge, and a few years in the racing game have made me easily suspicious. I was even more suspicious when Tom said, all nonchalant... Anyone care to lay four fibres on her? We declined. And I had a quid at threes on George Lansbury. I was convinced was improving with every race. <laughs> Under starters' orders. And. They're off! And it's Kehardi away first, followed by Lansbury and Samantha. Samantha taking the lead over the first hurdle, under the second. And it's Samantha way ahead and the rest nowhere. As Samantha grabs the tin salmon and tries to hurl herself through the fucking door! <laughs> What a race! Samantha first, Lansbury second, Keir Hardy still struggling to the post. Could I have a word with you, Tom? Who thought Casper was Lord Derby the way he carried on? He actually produced a red handkerchief from his pocket, which I correctly guessed to be cat racing's equivalent of the red flag at Newmarket or Epsom, denoting a steward's inquiry. <laughs> you doped that cat, didn't you? <laughs> What are you talking about? Yeah, why, you gave it a dexedrine or some sort of pep pill, didn't you? You better watch what you're saying, Casper. Nobody accuses me of cat doping. <laughs> well, I'm accusing you, friend. Mm. Wait, come outside. <laughs> and that was the end of cat racing. Or was it? A few weeks later, chancing to wake up in Battersea for reasons now lost in the mists of time, I was walking home through the park, and who should I bump into but Casper? What you doing, Casper? Cantering Kiar Hardy. <laughs> oh, yes. We could be in for another hot summer, a drought, in fact, in which case the going could get so hard that racing might have to be cancelled again. You never know, Jeff. <laughs> you never do. Just wait till he gets the sun on his back. For God's sake! Talk about waiting for Godo. <laughs> now the bugger's not there. He must have gone to Smithfield to select the savoury mince. <laughs> if I stayed in the French pub last night, none of this would have happened, but I was driven out of the French pub, wasn't I, by a bloke who came up to me and said... Do you remember Peter the Pope? who worked in the dirty bookshop in St Anne's Court. You know the bloke whose father's an ear, nose and throat surgeon in Warsaw? Well, anyway, he's just moved to Hounslow. <laughs> There's no answer to that. <laughs> not only do I not know Peter the Pole, I've never even heard of him, nor care greatly how his father scrapes a living, I also have very little time for a man who moves to Hounslow and wouldn't trust him an inch, so I repaired to the coach and horses to ponder the meaning of life 
a man's incredible ascent from the discovery of fire and the invention of the wheel to the ability to move to Hounslow, whereupon a Glaswegian drunk reeled up to me and said, Hey, Jimmy, I bet you've never seen a black man's funeral. There's no answer to that. I'm... So I turned aside only to be confronted by Norman's unfortunate mother who whispered in my ear. I bet you didn't know my grandfather had an umbrella shop in Gower Street. <laughs> Oddly enough, the possibility of Norman's mother's grandfather having had an umbrella shop in Gower Street had never crossed my seething brain, all the... <laughs> God knows I'm a broad-minded man. Well, <laughs> after a short but emotional discussion on the subject of the 1890 umbrella boom in Get Gower it. Street, I felt in need of a strictly medicinal drink. <laughs> and in the hour or two it took to get served, it suddenly clicked. I was in the middle of some dreadful plot. These mad utterances were codes or ciphers like the 39 steps or the five orange pips or the dancing men. Obviously, I had to meet a man with a Polish accent in Hounslow who would give me a message to deliver to a dead black man in an umbrella shop in Gower Street. <laughs> Nothing so extraordinary about that, is there? But I still needed that drink, and just as my trembling fingers raised it to my lips, a Glaswegian sprang at me again. No, oh, you haven't. It. When they die, they turn them into motor car tyres. <laughs> What the fuck am I doing with last month's Vogue? <laughs> Perhaps I'm supposed to be writing something for them. Who's in and who's out in the drinking clubs? No knickers Joyce is in, herpes Henry is out. <laughs> or perhaps I'm in it. Geoffrey Barnard seen throwing up over a friend on Ladies' Day at Royal Ascot. <laughs> Well, the sun ought to be well over the yard arm summer in the universe by now. Time for a Bloody Mary. The merit of these things is that you can persuade yourself you're having breakfast. <laughs> and a healthy one at that. Though it's possible to overdo the health angle. A bloke I know had 14 healthy breakfasts on the trot and what with one thing leading to another didn't get home till six the following morning when he was... <laughs> totally legless and bursting for a pee. <laughs> Falling out of the taxi was just about to urinate in desperation against the offside rear wheel, which, like all of us, he erroneously supposed to be legal. <laughs> when a dear old couple hove into sight, very possibly on their way to early morning mass, some modicum of decorum prompted our man to do the decent thing, so he zipped up and bounded up the steps to his front door, which he attempted to unlock. Unfortunately, his keys not being magnetic, he was unable to make contact. <laughs> One knows the problem. Health hint. A good cure for shaky hands. Grip the glass very firmly. <laughs> so... Our man can't get his key in the lock, and by now he's at his wit's end. There's only one thing to do, so he inserts his member through the letterbox and proceeds to <laughs> relieve himself copiously. <laughs> now, it so happens that at this precise moment, his landlord, a naturally angry man who has been trying to evict our hero for some months, <laughs> is coming down the staircase with a not unreasonable intention of taking his dog for a walk. <laughs> you can imagine his and Fido's bemusement when... <laughs> 
confronted not with the terror of a buff envelope thudding through the letterbox, but <laughs> with our man's cascading member. The hound backed away, snarling and steaming. The landlord, one could only imagine, clutched his fluttering heart. And our man politely turned his head and said good morning to the church-going pair he'd originally tried to avoid offending. There has to be a model there somewhere, but I'm <laughs> damned if I can work out what it is. Cheers. My own worst experience in the same direction was waking up in the bottom drawer of an Edwardian wardrobe. <laughs> Dying to spend a penny. Just imagine trying to open a drawer from the inside and you were... <laughs> You would appreciate my predicament, but however desperate I was, I would never have tried to do it through the keyhole. <laughs> I mean, just imagine if that dog had been of a more savage disposition. The, <laughs> the eyes water just to think of it. <sighs> I need this. Because I am reluctantly reminded of the man in the papers who chopped off his own chopper and threw it in the fire. <laughs> so he could devote the rest of his life to God without any further distractions. <laughs> With his wife's blessing, wouldn't you know, they've been discussing it for 12 years. <laughs> she was probably a Guardian reader. <laughs> But what I want to know is, why did that wretched man pick on his perfectly harmless cock? <laughs> Surely he must have realised that sex is all in the mind and that his dangler was merely his solo instrument in a far bigger concerto than you or I will ever comprehend. I mean, <laughs> if I wanted to devote the rest of my life to any one thing without being distracted, I'd cut off my head. <laughs> And another thing, why dispose of the black bald ex-member on the fire? What on earth does he think waste paper baskets are for? <laughs> oh, I can't help wondering what this couple's sex life must have been like during their 12 years of disarmament talks. <laughs> Pretty tentative, I should think. <laughs> the fact that God didn't intervene in the matter proves my theory that he is a woman after all. <laughs> Probably another Guardian reader. <laughs> and who took the initiative? What a mug. I mean, it so happens I don't have a wife at present, but if there chanced to be a Mrs. Bernard Mark V and she took to chatting me up on certain lines, I'm sure I'd be more than suspicious. So why won't you? Why won't I? What? Cut it off. Uh. <laughs> why should I? You never do anything for me these days. <laughs> You never do the shopping, you won't wash up, you don't ever bring me a cup of tea in bed. I know you're a lazy, idle, selfish brute, Jeff, but for heaven's sake, is it such a big thing? Not really, no. <laughs> then cut it off. No! Please, pretty please for me, darling, come on. Just be a love and cut it off. You know, there's a possible TV sitcom series in this. <laughs> Then I shall just have to cut it off for you. Yeah. <laughs> Not. Despite these occasional nightmares, that there's a slightest chance of there ever being a fifth Mrs. Bernard. I've learned very slowly that for a boozer on my scale, marriage is impossible. Drink is the other woman. With the evidence of the affair, 
Only two visible. Come along, Mr. Bernard. <laughs> There's only one place for you. At last, after years of trying, I eventually landed the spring double. Pneumonia and pleurisy. <laughs> <laughs> so here I was, back in the same hospital where I was first shown the yellow card back in December 1965. But this was the first time I'd ever been in hospital for something which wasn't self-inflicted, and that made it seem a little unfair. <laughs> I mean, they didn't conscript kamikaze pilots, did they, darling? Eat your mints. Eat your mints, eat your mints. Take your knickers off. They put me in the Ellen Terry ward, just down the corridor from the Alfred Tennyson. The nurses were nice. It's not always the case. The patients never change, though. They must be provided by some sort of agency. <laughs> There's always a paisley dressing gown sort of bloke with a jar of tip tree jam in the locker and trouble with what he calls the old waterworks. <laughs> There's always someone dying in a resigned sort of way. It's the usual cast. Some readers to a man, they stare vacantly at Hungarian children's cartoons on the box all afternoon, occasionally coughing and farting, and to think that's going to be the curtain-down scene for most of us. And the menu for the Last Supper will be brown Windsor soup <laughs> and minced beef with cabbage and boiled potatoes. Just a little prick, Geoffrey. They always say that. <laughs> it's their joke. <laughs> little pricks please little minds, don't they, darling? Eat your prunes. <laughs> Needless to say, in this situation, one's thoughts do tend to drift towards the Grim Reaper. There's a dreadful fellow in the French pub who once tried to make a book on who would be next in Soho for the last jump, and he made me five to four favourites, so he was pleased to tell me. <laughs> but the long shots keep coming in. And although I'm only too delighted to survive, it's a lousy race to have been entered for. Eva? Frank Norman, John Lemez, Sean Lynch, who ran Jerry's Club, and Jim. Dennis Shaw, even. <coughs> Dan, Dan. Dear old Jeremy Madden Simpson. Rechristened by Eva, Jeremy Madman Simpleton. Certainly won't be walking into the coach and horses come opening time. Oh, he hadn't turned 40. The first game really friendly after I broke a bone in my right hand on him one night in the French pub, for what reason neither of us could remember, but he'd say... But if you can't hit a friend, who can you hit? When I was at death's door in this very hospital, he used to visit me every evening with a croissant for tomorrow's breakfast. When a piss artist takes time off during license hours to visit you, you know you've got a friend. <laughs> Sometimes when I wonder whether this interval on earth might be just a bit of nonsense, Think about all those friends who've gone. And the lunchtime sessions in the coach when they were all still here were worth all the trappings of all the success stories you've ever heard. And I'd rather keep down with the likes of Jeremy than up 
with the judges. I do worry about my own wretched mortality. Shuffling off this mortal coil, it's though I'm in a queue that's shuffling along towards a sort of bus stop. Who's next? Oh, sorry, chum, you were before me. Maybe the party could go on there. Different premises and no closing time. <laughs> A kind of celestial and sterilized colony room club. Mr. Bernard. Mr. Bernard, are you trying to set the hospital on fire? Only the bed, Doctor. I have no territorial ambitions. <laughs> I'm discharging you, Mr. Bernard, but I want you to do absolutely nothing for at least two or three weeks. <laughs> It'll be too difficult. By which I mean you are to stay at home. Yes, Doctor. Home is where the heart is. I wonder if Norman will let me live here. I mean, considering I do live here, he might as well be charging rent. <laughs> what do you want to strike me, though? I can hang about in the window of the reject shop in the King's Road. I mean, I could actually get bought by someone quite nice. <laughs> I see myself being bought by a tarty blonde who showed me off to a friend in a sleazy afternoon drinking club in Shepherd Market. Yes, I bought him in the reject shop in Chelsea. Not bad for 25 quid, including VAT. <laughs> Couldn't get it up, mind you, when I first got him home. But it's amazing what a couple of stiff bookers will do. <laughs> Have another love. A number of personalities could further their careers in the reject shop. Coach and horses. <laughs> Norman! What the fuck do you mean? What am I fucking doing here? How the fuck did you know I was fucking here? Oh, I see. The cleaning lady. No. She's not arrived yet. Any messages? <laughs> it's a long story, Norman. No, in fact, it's a short story. I fell asleep in the bog, and why the hell don't you call time gents, please, in the gents? I mean, I would have thought there'd be some kind of legal requirement under the landlord's liability, I don't <laughs> Talking of the law, Norman, I appear to have caned the best part of a bottle of vodka. Does that count as drinking after hours? I mean, given the circumstances. I'll tell you one thing, Norman, the service was a bloody sight faster than it usually is. <laughs> If you made this Britain's first self-service pub, you'd <laughs> quadruple the takings overnight. Yes, Norman. Norman, I owe you for vodka. One of the juice. Dash of Worcester sauce. Tea bag. And a slightly cracked egg. Oh, and a tin of biscuits, which unfortunately became spilt. What do you mean, what have I been up to all night? I've been sitting here quietly nursing my drink and contemplating the meaning of life. It's all going to change, Norman, starting tomorrow. <laughs> all right, if you insist, to fucking day. 
How long are you going to be? Because I won't move till you get here. I'm hardly in a position to move, am I? I'll just get on with my packing. <laughs> my packing. It's another long story, mate. Just get off your ass. I get down here. He's coming. I've never seen Norman at seven in the morning before. <laughs> Should be a fascinating if grisly sight. <laughs> Come to that, he's never seen me at seven in the morning either. People who have say I'm not at my best. <laughs> <laughs> Though they do generously add that I'm not at my worst either. <laughs> Dearest Geoffrey, Jeff, dear. Dear Jeff. So looking forward to next weekend. Wasn't last weekend fun? Still missing you terribly. So looking forward to Friday. I waited and waited. Where were you? We must try harder. I'm tired of your excuses. We can't go on like this. I must have been mad to think it would work. It's goodbye, Jeff. This time I really mean it. You've gone too far. And I make her sick. There's a bloke I know in what's left of Fleet Street who plans to sink his redundancy money into an establishment to be called a This Time I Really Mean It Hotel. <laughs> Specially designed for people who just walked out on or been walked out on by their spouses. You could check in at any hour of the night without luggage. There'd be a razor, toothbrush, and change your clothes on every pillow, along with the after-dinner Valium wrapped in tinfoil. And there'd be a 24-hour bar known as the Gone Too Far Bar. <laughs> and every night they'd have an unhappy hour. The things one keeps. An old dry cleaning bill. To removing tartar sauce from top pocket. <laughs> I have no memory of that whatsoever. But I do have unhappy memories of tartar sauce in general. One day in the Groucho Club, I woke up thinking I'd gone blind. I was scared shitless. It turned out I'd been resting my head on a grilled turbot and had tartar sauce all over my wedding glasses. <laughs> this is good. A demand from the Inland Revenue for £1,760. It is to be hoped they're pulling my piss up. 176 quid would just about crucify me, but 1,760 is a joke utterly beyond me. <laughs> There's always suicide, of course. So many of us around here have contemplated it at one time or another that Dave in the French pub once had the idea of us all hiring a coach and driving it over Beachy Head. <laughs> 52 seats only.
Book now to avoid disappointment. <laughs> I better have the one. Norman? No, it's the milkman. Always the signal to the law-abiding citizen to be making tracks home. <laughs> if he had a home to go to. <laughs> oh, what the hell? This is a home. Sitting by the bedside of dying Soho, holding her hand, but wondering, wouldn't it be kinder to switch off the life support system? What an amazing Jemmy through the door of a mine is a few larger vodkas. Let's start a club for people who've been barred from all the others. Instead of throwing members out, we'll throw them in. You don't bring me flowers anymore. Don't worry, Jeff. Give it me back when you get a win. Couldn't you have telephoned? Now, if I put you in a cab, will you promise not to fall out the other door? You only get out of life what you put into it. Fancy a spot of cat racing, Jeff? You're a mean, alcoholic, diabetic prick. And you make me sick. But you're never snide, and you never hurt. And you wouldn't want to win on a doctored beast. And anyway, the least of your pleasures resides in paltry measures. So guard, great joker god, please guard this great Bernard. Let him be known for the prince of men he is, a master at taking out of himself and us the piss. Thank you. The bug is here at last. Come on, Goddard! And I meant what I said, Norman, it's all going to change starting to fucking day. It's new leaf time. From now on, it will be gin instead of vodka. <laughs> Capstan full strength instead of senior service and the French pump instead of the coach and horses. And life does go on, whatever proof there may be to the contrary. Last week I had an erection. I was so amazed. <laughs> I took its photograph. <laughs> Life after death. What more do you want? Come on, Norman. Yeah.